y'all. Hey, welcome back to my channel. You're tuned in for more of My Two Cents. This is Christian here. And over here on the My Two Cents platform, we embark on a journey of exploring the intricate tapestries of faith, spirituality, and the process of deconstruction through the lens of Christianity. Now, if you're joining me, we're going to engage in thought-provoking discussions and delve into the complexities of religious beliefs and navigate the paths of questioning and reconstruction. Whether you're seeking to deepen your understanding of faith or exploring the realms of deconstruction within the Christian context, this channel is a space for open dialogue, introspection, and a compassionate exploration of the intersections between belief, doubt, and discovery. So let's embark on this transformative journey together. And of course, there are three points that matter most before I begin any dis dis discussion or dialogue. Number one, you're not alone. Number two, you're not crazy. Number three, God, your creator so loves you and I do too. Now today is going to be a special video because it is a viewer email and I love these. I usually read over them a little bit just so I can get the gist of what the email is about and to know if I need to give you any trigger warnings and things of that nature. And I give my live response and reaction to the email here in video format. So thank you guys so much for sending in your emails, for sharing your stories, your deconstruction journey, where you are right now, uh, what has happened to you in the past, if you have any traumatic, toxic experiences with religion or church culture. It means a lot. When I started this platform, I believe it was my first video in 2020. I'm not, I don't really remember at this point, but my, why I quit church video. Um, when I first post, posted that video, I didn't really know that there was a term for what I had done and what I had gone through. I didn't really know that there was a term for the process of doing away with old thoughts and old beliefs and then literally renewing the mind. Um, and it was known as deconstruction and reconversion and reconstructing. I had no clue that there was a community for this. And in that journey, I did feel alone. I did feel confused. Um, I was afraid. I did have fear that my portion would be hell. It was so much. It was so much that was going on internally, but externally, I was still here. I was still thriving. I still had chances and opportunities and options, and I was exercising them. And the deeper I got into it, the more information that I found, the more research that I did, the more knowledge uh, that was imparted into me from my creator, I didn't seek, you know, con confirmation. I didn't seek approval from other people. But I do know that if I had a channel like this to, you know, like dig into and to gl glean from, I would have been grateful just to know I wasn't alone. So that's why I am excited. And I'm always grateful whenever you guys send emails and share your stories, because I know that I am not the only one that has gone through this. I know that this is not a safe space usually to share. There are not a lot of safe spaces to share because people are so judgmental. Like people immediately go to you're deceived and Satan is using you and Satan has deceived you. And this is nothing but the trick of the enemy trying to, you know, drive people away from the church. And in the last days, there'll be a, you know, mass exodus from church. And I'm like, y'all say that because of scripture and the prophecy of scripture. But what you don't understand is that there are things going on in the body that is sickening. There is a sickness. There is, there is no well-being. There is no formula to actually heal and deliver people in church. There's more of a background and a foundation to hurt and, you know, to expose you to things that you're going to need more healing and deliverance from. And so uh, when you all share, it just shows that I'm not making up my stories, that I'm not imagining my stories um, and that I'm not alone in wanting to share my stories, but wanting to have a safe place to do it with someone that is unbiased, who will not try to combat people's truth with scripture. I've said this before. A lot of Christians, a lot of religious people use the Bible as a sword and a shield, um, a sword to stab people, to hurt people, to condemn people, to judge people. Uh, to diminish people in their experiences and their, their truths. And then it's a shield to protect themselves um, from accountability, to protect themselves from uh, someone else's response to 
their uh, condemnation. And it's not fair to use the Bible, use a resource that is meant to build up and encourage and also inform and instruct that you all see it as as a weapon against people who don't also believe in it or agree with all of the things that are in it. Um, and so it's like a double edged sword where you're like, no, I don't want this. But at the same time, some of the values and the principles actually, you know, are okay for me. Where do you find that balance? And so I see that some of you may still be battling with that. Like, how do I navigate this space? How do I overcome some things and I don't really know what I should be doing right now? And that's when we can have these conversations and I can read your stories and other people can hear them. And some people may be able to see themselves reflected in what you're saying and sharing. And some people may be like, dang, I didn't have that experience, but I do have this one. And it's just a lot of retrospect. And it helps us to be introspective of where we want to go next. And we can do that with respect. We can respectfully say that wasn't my experience, but I hear you, I see you, and I support you. This was my experience and I've learned from it, I've grown from it, and this is where I am now because of it. And so I try to find that balance, never telling you what to do, but always encouraging you to continue on the path that helps you to remain free. So let's get into today's email. This viewer has been asked to remain not anonymous and y'all know me. I keep you anonymous irregardless. That is not a word. I keep you anonymous irregardless because I chose YouTube as a public platform. You did not. So even if you allow me or you give me the green light to use your name, I never will because I just feel like everybody deserves to be protected in whatever they choose to share in case somebody somewhere may be listening that knows you or know of your situation. They may be like, oh, no, she didn't. No, he didn't share that and say that. Yes, they did, but you'll never know it. So the email starts off by saying, hi, Christian. Thank you so much for your platform, your voice, and how you continue to show up authentically in your truth. It's truly liberating and inspiring. It inspires me and reminds me that it's really okay to stand in my own truth. For me, I haven't put a label on what I'm doing. For example, deconstruction as I actually don't understand it quite fully as yet. Now that's great that she said that because I actually have a video outlined that I will be recording in the very near future about deconstruction. I'm gonna break down what that means. What does deconstruction mean? What does reconstructing mean? Re what does reconversion mean? Because these terms are being used heavily right now, heavily right now. And I want to provide some context at least from a basic standpoint, I don't want to go into no theological debates with y'all. I don't want to go too deep into it. I want to give you a base level understanding of what these terms mean and what it looks like for you in application. All right. Okay. Just know since not attending church from last year, December, 2022, I can now say, looking back the beginning of 2023, I was so scared, not even of God, but what the people in my youth group, I'm assuming what the people in my youth group would say about me not being in church every Sunday, including Tuesdays, 6.30 a.m. prayer on site. Bear in mind, I work nine to five. Oh, child, not you waking up at 6.30. Not, no, 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 no. Let me take that back. You didn't wake up at 630 to go to prayer. You had to wake up earlier than 630 to get to prayer on site and be at work at 9 a.m. The people's be pushing y'all. OK, but y'all be faithful. All right. Yes, y'all do be. Um, bear in mind, I work a nine to five. Wednesday, band practice, Thursday, small group meeting, bi-weekly, Friday, all night prayer, occasionally, Saturday, conference, occasionally. Ah, it was a lot to the point where I felt like my identity was becoming what I do in church. See my video. I think this was my second video that I posted after my why I quit church. I posted a video about losing my identity, having an identity crisis because of church. And to have you say this like three, four years later after me posting that video is everything because this is the path, you guys. You get into church, you be all in, you give your everything to the ministry, and then you realize you don't have an identity outside of that environment. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you like. You don't know what you can do. You don't know what's safe to do, what's okay to do, what's approved to do, what's wrong to do, what's a sin to do, what's a sin to think, what's a sin to act like, what's a sin to be involved in. You literally just engulf yourself in church 
in church culture, in church environments, in church experiences, and you no longer exist as the individual that you came out of your mother's womb as. But I digress, okay? To the point where I felt like my identity was becoming what I do in church. I'm currently 26 and I started attending my local Pentecostal church at 18. Okay, so that's eight years dedicated. Let's give it to her. This was a shock to the system as I previously attended a more conservative Methodist church. We did our thing on Sundays. They love you on Sunday and they left you alone until the following Sunday. My God. Yes, yes, yes. I talked about that in my uh, toxic church culture part one, I think, or maybe I think it was part one video, how the black church is not the same as the white church. Watch the video, y'all. It was in, it was very powerful to hear the breakdown and the correlation on a basic level because I'm never trying to talk over y'all heads. I'm always trying to meet you where you are based off of the experience and the logic that we would all be able to see if we just looked at it from a natural perspective. Not trying to be super deep, not trying to be super oily, not trying to be, you know, anointed. Just, dang, on a, on a basic level, there's a difference in how black people do church and how white people do church. That It just is. And from you literally saying this right here, you had previously gone before going to a Pentecostal church, which is what I was grown. I grew up in. You had gone to a conservative Methodist church. How many of y'all want to bet that she wasn't around a whole lot of us? <laughs> just saying but even if she had been around a lot of us the structure is different with the uh the attendance with the control with the bondage now it still exists but it's a little more passive and it's a little less under my thumb and a little more you're free to come as you are go as you please and we'll see you next time we reconvene like that's just the that's the setup and that's the flow but that's not how it is in other church cultures, specifically Pentecostal. So it's really refreshing to see you say that because that again validates what I like the comparison that I made of white church experience versus black church experience. They let you go. Like they're not trying to keep tabs on you and create all of these events and these um, uh, what, what services for you to be a part of. Um, I saw a meme a couple of months ago that said these pastors be having y'all in all this stuff, these prayer circles and these small groups and stuff because they lonely. They just keep on coming up with stuff for y'all to do together because they don't have a life outside of doing anything with you at all. And that was very enlightening as well. All right. So she said that they loved you on Sunday and let you left you alone until the following Sunday. Oh, and then the casual, the occasional uh, picnic or whatnot. So there was a few, well, you know, community fellowship gatherings. But other than that, you could come and go as you please. And that is the model that I think would best suit many believers. But they don't seek that one. They seek the one that is controlling and the one that has an overseer feeling to it. Not the one that allows you to be who you are until you're back in the presence to worship together. This was different. I felt the need to be on fire for God. Every Sunday, they drummed serving into us. So I picked up just about every serving job I could. And she is not talking about down to the local Applebee's or Chili's. Okay. She's not talking about being a server. All right. Of the two for 25. <laughs> no, 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 no. She is not talking about picking the crispy, crunchy chicken strips or the six ounce sirloins. That's not the server that she's talking about. She's talking about the server of being on all of these different teams and auxiliaries in order to wrap up baby girl schedule. Okay, all right. So that was drummed into them every week. I was telling my mother just last week, y'all, I was just telling her that it is, and it's crazy because old school believers, you guys, they're not aware of the new school tactics of the new school, um, uh, how do I say it? Like manipulation that is played on their vulnerability and their desire to be faithful to their church. They're not aware that their, their leaders literally play into that and abuse that. They abuse their desire to be close to God and to serve in church and find a way to hook their 
you know, they claws into them. Like, oh, you want to serve? I got some for you. Like, oh, you love God? Come here. It's one of them kind of things. And I was telling my mom, I was like, mom, so you just don't notice how the more your pastor needs to grow the ministry or the more new people attend, they immediately try to get them to uh, join an auxiliary, join a team, join a group, uh, get on the nurses board, become a greeter. You know what I'm saying? Meet with such a, such and such, and such to be a part of the hospitality committee. Oh, you're good at planning. Become a part of our, you know, um, oh, what is that committee that we had back in the day in my church? Uh, when they planned like the pastor's appreciation and all this other stuff, like become a part of this group and that group, depending on your skill, like get involved in something that is an intricate part of business one-on-one. -on -one. Like I even have to practice it having employees. I know the more responsibility and title you give a person, the more loyal they are, the more they feel like they're a part of the ecosystem and what they provide is important. So they're going to drop everything else outside of that to be committed to that. You can't, it's hard for you to uh, get people to do something if they're not committed to it. It's like, uh, oh, you just get to come and go as you please on Sunday. You're not involved in anything. Hmm. So I can't really count on you. Let's get her into something so that we know she's going to be here every week. We know that he's going to be here every week. If he's an armor bearer or if he's a deacon or if he's a part of parking lot duty, we know that he's going to give us his Sunday. We know she's going to give us her Wednesday. We know they're going to be here for, you know, 6 a.m. prayer. You give people title and make them feel connected. They're going to give you their commitment. And that's why title and position comes in church. No matter who you are, no matter what your background is, it's almost like going from being a cafeteria worker to a principal. You may not meet the qualifications, but you've been here long enough. Let's go ahead and just bump you up real quick, baby. <laughs> we know you've been putting, you know, and some kids that they want fries and mashed potatoes, but now we see something in you. Bertha, we see something in you, Bertha. Come on up to the main office. <laughs> It's like you just immediately get this um, promotion in ministry that you know. I, I mean, like not saying there's qualifications for being a nurse or there's qualifications for being an altar worker or there's qualifications for you to be a greeter or qualifications for you to, you know, uh, be on the welcome committee. But the point is, if I get you involved immediately, you feel like you're a part and you're a part of a community and you're a part of something bigger and they need me. They don't, <laughs> they need your warm body. Let's be clear. So with her saying, I picked up just about every serving job I could from main church choir to leading youth choir, to being an usher Sundays when I wasn't on choir, to information desk after service, to organizing events, to leading and attending small group sessions in someone's house. Damn, I was doing it all because I thought that was what being on fire for God meant. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Say what? <laughs> Y'all be thinking I be making stuff up. This is by and large. By and large, not by and small, not by and medium. This is by and large, the majority of people's experience in organized religion and church culture. You would complain on your regular job if they tried to give you six titles and positions and job descriptions with no pay increase. You wouldn't do it. You would be hauling oats. I can't go for that. No, mm. no can do. You would be, I can't go for that. You would be in HR so fast, okay? HR would stand for he ran, <laughs> not human resources. It would be he ran to the office so fast. She ran to the office so quick. You wouldn't go for that. But at church, you literally will overwork and be underappreciated, not Oh, underpaid, you would be underappreciated, but you would be engulfed in all of the systems and positions that help your ministry to thrive. 
And they're okay with that because that's what God requires. God requires for you to be involved in all that the church does, all that the church has to offer. Find a way to serve. Get your hands in something. Become a part of the kingdom. Build it up. Lift it. Now, mind you, you got all these folks from all these other religions and cults, if you will, respectfully. Um, the one that comes to mind when she mentions all of what she joined, y'all just read all of what, what I, y'all heard all of what I said, and y'all can read on screen for yourself. She just listed off all of these positions and it brings to mind, um, Scientology. I remember watching that docu-series by Lisa Remney and them talking about the contract that they would have you sign. And the million year contract, y'all, and how the adults would join, but then they would pretty much sign away their rights to their children, to the organization. And the children would go from the C org, right? They made up these positions. They made up these places for people to feel like they belong. These folks were not working regular jobs and then doing this stuff. They literally were signing up to become a part of the government of this religious organization that was also man-made. Okay? Which is mind-boggling to me that we look at things like uh, Scientology, that we look at these other religions and, and say and be able to clearly see, oh, those were made up by the leader. Yes, as was yours. And your, your church, your pastor, your, your local minister is consistently adding to the religion every Sunday based off of what he needs from you. Seeing that parents were willing to signed themselves up for a million years, <laughs> ridiculous, uh, signed themselves up for a million years to serve Scientology and then to go through the ranks of being different, like in different positions, like this man, Ron L. Hubbard, that was his name. Ron L. Hubbard literally had been a failure in the military, in the Navy, if I'm not mistaken, either he didn't go or he didn't get to pass like some kind of test or something like that. So he pretty much created Scientology to have his own organization. Like, oh, I'll, t I'll show you. You don't want to let me in. You don't want to let me be a part. I'm going to create my own. And he did. And people literally have horror stories, trauma and toxicity running through their veins because of what they experienced at the helm of his belief system. And once he passed away, which they claimed he was never going to do, you have Savage. Is it Salvage? <laughs> I'm going to call him a Savage. I'm a Savage. Yeah. Him. He steps up and gets to carry on the torch of torture, of torment. So you look at these people and you're like, dang, it ain't that different. They just want you to join in on whatever term and and condition that they can monopolize your time. The difference between the black church and Scientology and a lot of these other, like the FLMA, FLDS, they want you to pull away from society, period. These organizations take these folks off the grid, okay? They had them living in the wilderness, if you will. They had these folks on reservations. They had these folks in the buildings that they bought, they had these folks living in bunk beds. They had these folks <laughs> living in warehouses. They got these people literally bunking up, living up together as adults away from society. The difference between modern day church culture and other religions like Christianity, they don't want to pluck you out of society, baby. They need you to keep working. <laughs> mm -mm. That's why you ain't never finna find no black church leader running a full-fledged open cult like FLMA or Scientology, right? Or Jim Jones. I don't even know what they were called. You're not going to find that because these men sought to create their own governments. They sought to create their own ecosystems outside of the societal standards where you needed the resources of the world. They wanted to create pipelines. Maybe they wanted to have their own water. They wanted to generate their own lights. They had these men out here building all kinds of infrastructures on the land that they bought. Let's be abundantly clear. The difference of why you don't have to worry about that happening in black churches. Cause these men's with the Z is not about to take care of you and your family. <laughs> Let's be clear. At least these other men, at least these other cult leaders and whatever creators, 
at least they was like, mm, we gonna provide for our people, okay? Not these black pastors. They like, no, you're gonna take care of me, Marilyn. You're gonna go to work for me, Demetrius, okay? You're gonna go get your check and bring it back for me to live in a mansion. We are not going to live in a, a 15 bedroom compound together. We're not going to have land and property together. No, 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 no. I'm not going to marry all of y'all. Okay. And give y'all a, a, a life as a wife. I'm going to have y'all as my, you know, financial side pieces, but we shall not cohabitate. That's the difference. Y'all do not have to worry about having open cults in these churches because these pastors are not about to do infrastructure work. They barely want to allow you to use the fellowship hall for a baby shower or a reception. They definitely not going to buy land for y'all and then have y'all all cohabitate together. <laughs> like you mean. Yeah, they not doing that. <laughs> They're not. So with her giving all of her time, resources, intellect, and emotions to these ministries, she was separated from society. She was separated from her, her regular environment of family and friends and peers, but she was still going out amongst the world to gain resources to bring back into the storehouse, also known as the church. Okay. She still like, we still need you to go out there. We need you to be sheep amongst the wolves in the world and get that money, honey. But you still need to come in here and be a part of the youth choir. You need to be a part of the prayer team. You need to organize these events. You need to be at the information booth in the center. You need to attend and, and, and lead small group sessions. You go do your regular job to get that money. Okay. But you also need to come in here and do these jobs too. Okay, just call me Stevisha. Stevisha Jobs. You have Steve Jobs and then you got Stevisha Jobs. They want you to be Stevisha Jobs and do all of the things to build their kingdom. But I digress. So she says she thought that that's what it meant to be on fire for God. That's not what it means. That's what it means to be on fire for the man of God. <laughs> that, that's what it means to do the things for the man of God. But God doesn't require you to be over small groups and over youth choir and the information booth and... None of that, none of that matters to your heavenly father. That matters to your earthly leader. Take me to your leader. He's in his office in the back, probably drinking his cranberry or orange juice, getting his forehead wiped, you know, playing Tetris or Pac-Man before he comes out and does service. Mm, I, whatever. I don't know what y'all pastors be doing on their iPads and their laptops, but I can tell you right now, it ain't nothing deep. Because you're doing more work than they are. Isn't that amazing? Huh. I'm not going to go off on a rant on that. Let's focus. Fast forward to a year later, the same youth group that called me family. Sis, nobody has honestly checked on me since December of 2022. Not you was family and sis. <laughs> That's why I don't be calling nobody sister nothing no more. Everybody that I grew up with having to call sister this, sister Johnson, right? Sister, uh, I don't want to use nobody's real name, but hell, who cares? Sister, uh, I don't, don't want to use nobody's real name. I don't want to do it. But y'all wouldn't know that they was a real names. But since your girl on the microphone conflicted, y'all may think of oh, next name she say going to be a real one. Sister Smith, right? Sister Donovan, right? Brother Johnson, Brother Mayweather, okay? Uh-huh. Brother Martin, let's use, let's use celebrity names, right? Brother Will, mm-hmm. Brother Watkins, mm-hmm. Sister Sierra, Sister Taraji, Sister Tracy, Sister Regina, all of these people, you, you're made to give them these names and take them out of their human state of being where they're just Regina at Walmart. They're just, you know, Tanya down to the Walmart. They're just, you know, at the Kroger, at the, you know, Jack in the Box, down to the McDonald's, down to the Canes. They're just their first name. But no, when you're at church, you're like family. They got to give you a term of endearment to make you feel even more connected. But that is also manipulation. That's another video for another day. Nobody has checked in on me since December, 2022. They kind of just checked to see if I haven't backslidden or when I can join back the choir or serving a team. I bet, I bet they do. I bet they have reached out to you here and there sparingly to see where your antennas are. 
because you have to keep a pulse on your people when your people are the ones that make your kingdom actually run. The people who actually run your kingdom is not the king. It's not the head that runs the kingdom. It's all of the subservients. It's all, no empire, nothing runs without the actual people that know the offices, hold the offices and have to A, develop the systems, develop processes, download that stuff, and then allocate and, uh, no, what's the actual, what's the other word? Not allocate, um, delegate, delegate the responsibilities, shout out to the Rugrats, to the people. The pastor, your king, the leader, he's not the one doing that stuff. That's what there's an admin team for. That's what there's an assistant for. That's why you have program managers. You'll be high pressed to find a CEO. And I'm, I'm saying this from a CEO perspective, a person that sets up all of that stuff and then delegates it. The expectation level for me is low. I find funds, right? provide the vision, and then I hire a team to actually make that vision come to pass. I do not need to be a part of the intricate details to get all of that stuff to happen. I find the funds to do, well, no, I cast the vision, I find the funds in the provision, and then I hire a team in order for the vision to be executed. That is the same thing that happens with your pastors. You cannot refute it because that's exactly what they do. They fought, they cast the vision of where they want the church to go and what they claim the Lord has showed them and given them to do. They find the funds. They make sure that the members are given their money. They preach a message that gives you condemnation and judgment, pressure to get that money up at you. And then they make sure there are people in place for the vision to be executed. That's, that's baby girl right here serving on all these teams. The pastoring in the trenches, doing small group sessions at the information booth, running the media section, in the choir singing, the pastor has those jobs at the top. I'm going to cast the vision, make it plain. I'm going to get that money in Jesus' name, and I'm going to delegate the, uh, get some people in place so this church will never be the same. I'm not out here doing all the stuff that y'all doing. That is beneath me. I am the pastor. How dare you think I do that? <laughs> That's literally how it goes. It's just been an eye-opening journey, to say the least, to opening up to your youth pastor and then your conversations becoming a part of his sermon. Hmm. I've seen this happen on so many occasions. Yo, what you've shared in confidentiality becomes <laughs> the sermon. Say what? Do what now with who information? Oh, okay. Because I, I understand you're not an attorney, but there's no member, pastor confidentiality. There's, you know how you have attorney client privilege. There's just no pastor member privilege here. Like you just put my business in your sermon. You just talking at me from the stage. It's. That happens more often than not because it's as if though the pastor only gets information on what's going on in the pulse of the church when you confide in them. And when your pastor wants to add more pressure to you to get you to do what they want you to do or to feel as if though the Lord is leading you to do something different, they'll use what you've shared against you. To make you feel like, yeah, God requires more from you. God wants more for you to bless you in this next season. No, baby, I just told you what I was struggling with. That's not what God told you. You're just remixing it. You beatboxing on it, okay? Lil Run DMC, you beatboxing on my stuff. You Dougie freshen it up. I don't like that. Don't use what I've confided in you about to then turn around and make it a thus saith the Lord message. That is disgusting, which again proves and provides a background for the fact that your pastors are not being used by a higher power. <laughs> Baby, they are being empowered by the batteries that you continue to put in their backs. Because there's no real connection majority of the time to a higher source 
or to God, they literally just know what to say and how to say it. Great orators are just that. They're great speakers. They don't have to really be in tune with anything, but when you confide in them, you give them front row access so they can start seeming like they know what's going on. They can start to seem like they are attached to a higher source and power that reveals things to them. That's not what's happening. Keep your business to yourself. I've experienced that firsthand when we decided to leave the church that we had been at because our pastor was incompetent um, on some, in, amongst other things. He was incompetent. And he had poor conflict resolution skills. He lacked maturity. Uh, we got tired of calling him to the carpet on things and holding him accountable. Uh, it was annoying to say the least. But after we left and we shared with him and his wife in depth while we were leaving in order to um, protect his own behind, right? He decided to call in some people Oh shit, not me knocking over the microphone, honey. <laughs> he decided to pull in some people that he knew that we had been close with in church and to get in front of what he thought my husband and I might share. He started divulging things that we had told him or he started making up things about us in order to make us seem negative in their minds, telling them that we had stopped paying tithes and offering um, and other things. I'm like, where did he get that from? And even if we would have stopped paying tithes and offering, even if that had been true, let me be abundantly clear. That was nobody else's business. But the fact that you were willing to throw that in there to make us seem like horrible people, like we have been disconnecting for a while, is like, one, you making up lies, but two, had that been true, who, re who released you to share that business of ours with someone else because we were no longer covered under you? That's the concern to me that you two are sharing right here that your pastor felt safe or your youth pastor felt safe in taking a conversation and converting it into a sermon. There's no safety there. You're always in a vulnerable position with these people because you're free game in order to validate their calling and to make them seem in tune and aligned with God. They have to use the ammunition that you've put into their backs. It is usually against you. And that's the sad thing about it. From people gossiping about me and my boyfriend because he chose to not be a churchgoer, usually men can smell the bull and they stay far away from it. Baby, you go and I make sure this house is clean, this grass is cut and this barbecue is cooked by the time you get back. Okay, all right. Have a good Sunday. <laughs> men don't be going. Men's bull meter be going off when they get around pastors. No, I'm not coming here to submit to you in the church house and then going back home and trying to act like my wife should submit to me at the crib. I'm not doing it. Men don't be on that tip. You're not going to hustle me up out of my, my, my check. I went to work for these 40 plus hours. I'm not coming here to give you 10% of that, sir. No, thank you. Please show me your check. Let's, let's write our tithes check out together so I can see how much work you put in, in the field this week. I know how much time I put in the field this week. Let's see how much time you put in, in the field, not in the pulpit. That does not equate as real labor, sir. Because there are sermons for sale on Beyonce's internets. So I, I got to see what kind of work you did this week in order to get this check up off me. That's how men feel. So them gossiping about your boyfriend because he chose not to be a churchgoer. One thing that I am grateful to have learned a few, uh, a few lessons, a few tough lessons young. I would agree with that. I learned a lot of few, a lot of lessons at a young age. That's how I can be, um, 35 wise old, <laughs> 35 wise years on this earth in the last 14, last 15 years I've had majority of my experiences in church that led to me getting out of church culture and the church environment because I had more angst, more toxicity. I have only stories of bad adult experiences from church environments. I don't have any negative social encounters from worldly relationships, if you will. 
I don't have any negative experiences from any jobs I've worked. I've never been called into the office because I've been into it with a coworker. I never got into it with anyone when I was in college, when I was on campus staying. I have had no history of problems with people in regular society. Okay. I only have problems in stories from people in church because that's that was my main environment and that's the problem y'all when you're in the world but all of your problems are of church you don't say be in the world but not of it baby I might as well go out and be in the world because I will be of peace out there I have problems in the church with y'all that is the key point. So what you just said is you're grateful that you have, you've learned tough lessons young. Correct. Do not let those lessons go to waste. Stay out that place. I always want to see the best in everyone, but I've struggled to rationalize how some Christians are on Sundays versus the rest of the week. Correct. It's not giving Christ-like. Christian literally means Christ-like. I find myself being more like Christ outside of church than I ever was in. I had to constantly get out of myself. I had to constantly come up out of myself to deal with people, to ignore people. I was constantly shape shifting. I've never had to adjust my voice. I know a lot of people talk about, you know, work culture and, you know, having to co um, coach switch in certain environments and become somebody different. The only time I've ever had to code switch, and this is not really code switching by the definition, but the only time I had to become somebody different was when I was in radio because you do your radio personality. So there are certain things of my character that tied into my role on radio, but there were certain things that I had to talk about and show interest in that I did not care about, but I was on radio. So you have to give a damn when you don't really give a damn. Um, that was my job. But when I got home, I didn't care about that stuff. I didn't want to talk about that stuff. People who would see me out at Walmart and be like, oh, dainty C. I wouldn't care about none they had been talking about because they had heard me at work. <laughs> but when I was at home and in my regular space and in my regular environment, that wasn't me. That wasn't an interest of mine. That wasn't something I wanted to expound upon and, you know, go deeper into. I just didn't want to do that. But now that I think about it in church, I was constantly becoming somebody else other than myself. Always. Always. I couldn't rest in my identity because I was constantly taking off the mask and putting on a different one in order to appease somebody else that I was around who had questions or who had expectations based off of who they know my mother to be or who they know my husband to be or my uncle to be or environments they've seen me in or have heard about. I had to conform to those images of my own like identity. It was, it was tiring. Let me tell you that present day, I have never had to shape shift again. I get to be myself on a regular basis all the time. And I like that. I'm enjoying that. So the fact that you, you know, you said that you've struggled with rationalizing how Christians are different on Sundays versus the rest of the week. This is a common occurrence. This is a common occurrence. They are not, you know, as crazy as it's going to sound, they're not real people. They're almost like that girl said on that, um, that clip when she was on the air, the airplane earlier this year and she was pointing back to that seat and she was like, that is not real. Talking about back there is not real. Okay. <laughs> Y'all don't know what I just saw. That's how I feel about Christians. They are not real. They are shells of themselves. They're shells. They're empty. They're void. Their true personality and character has kind of been unplugged and emptied out to embody this new person that only exists in certain environments. And once they leave, they're trash. Let me just be abundantly clear. They do not live what they say. They do not practice what has been preached and they do not abide by the standards set in their own scripture text. And that is concerning. So let's go ahead and wrap this email up. I just hope God can lead me through as I embark on my journey to knowing him for me, for myself, baby. That is correcto mundo. That is what the focus should be. That is what the focus should be. So many people have given a negative connotation to deconstruction because they're upset that people are leaving church. People are not leaving God. I'm going to say this again. People in church are upset because they think 
and they want to give the narrative that people are walking away from God. They're not. People are walking away from you. People are walking away from your control, from your bondage, from your fear mongering, from your intolerance, from your judgment, from your hellfire and brimstone. People don't want your God. And they're upset about that. No, you can't just cherry pick scripture. Yes, I can. You cherry pick scripture every time you raise an offering because you don't go back through the New Testament or whatever y'all like to go back and forth about that makes it very clear what tithing is about. Y'all cherry pick scripture too. Especially when it benefits you. So who are you to say that I or she, him or they or them or we cannot do the same thing? Use it where it benefits you. Use it as it serves you. Chew the meat, spit out the bones. That's it. That's it. That's it. So you being, you having a desire to be led, you having a desire to be led and to have a deeper relationship or an, an understanding for yourself of who God is, is the true enlightenment. It is the true journey. It is the beauty of who all of us, you know, get to become on our own time and in our own right. We were stripped of that ability. Um, usually when we're given a doctrine that we don't understand, but we just hook in and just start playing along as we go. And it's all somebody else's storyline. It's not fair to us. But once we wake up and we choose to walk away, this is when people judge us. This is when people get upset. This is when people condemn and say hell will be the portion because they don't understand it. They only understand what they've been told. So to undo and unravel that the way that you're doing would mean that everything they've believed up until this point has been a lie or has been forced and they can't fathom giving that kind of power back to themselves because they've literally handed over the responsibility for their own journey to someone else their entire lives. So what you're doing is definitely groundbreaking. Keep on walking. Please do not give up. The journey is definitely going to take time to feel a little more comfortable because you've literally been programmed You've literally been programmed to believe only what you were told and never what you researched, never what you found out for yourself, never what was revealed to you. You don't even know your own voice. People talk about hearing from God. People don't even know how to hear themselves. That's even more toxic church culture and belief to be constantly told you need to hear from God. Did you hear from God? Did God speak to you? How would I know what that sounds like when your body, when your voice is the only one in my head, baby? <laughs> Please stop talking to me so I can really know who I'm hearing from. People hear their pastor's voice more than they hear God's. Hmm. Okay. Thank you for the beautiful work you're doing. You have no idea the impact it's having. And then she closed out, you know, by saying her pleasantries. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the email. I appreciate you sharing your story. I appreciate you being vulnerable enough to... Uh, share how you feel and what your thoughts are. You are not alone. You are not crazy. And God, your creator still loves you. If you guys have an email that you want to send to me, you would love to, for me to read and get my two cents on, please do so at my two cent matters with an S at gmail.com. That's my two cent matters at gmail.com. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this one. If you can relate in any way, drop down in the comment section below and let me know. Until next time, like the video, subscribe to the channel. I would love to add you to my two cents crew. Bye.